Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, I'm here with Nomi, and our special guest today is John. And today we're going to be talking about what the question is and why does it matter. Okay, welcome John, welcome Nomi. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, let's begin. Um, let's start off with what we mean when we say free will, okay, what most people mean. So generally, um, in our language, um, we mean that we have a free will. People who believe they have, a fr they have a free will believe that they are free to make their choices, one, regardless of to whom they were born, um, two, and, and who raised them, okay? Um, th um, another another um, way that people kind of like define free will is, um, you know, that they believe that have, they have a free will to decide whatever they want, regardless of what they learned in school, you know, how young and old they are, just like, you know, there's various um, kinds of like, you know, understandings that people use, you know, to, to describe this. And, and, and basically our show is about explaining how these are really illusions, you know, because like, you know, basically what, um, what allows us, what, what compels our choices are these things, and there are a lot of them. Uh, John, like for example, would you want to bring in some some other kinds of um, conditions that um, that you know um, relate to free will? That actually, you know, when people say free will, they, they mean that um, they can make choices without these kinds of things. Well, uh, I can just talk about my current understanding of free will, which may evolve during this conversation. Um, I c it's hard for me to imagine free will without some kind of constraints. To me, you can't be free without constraints. For instance, I can speak English, and you can speak English, but I don't know consciously the laws of grammar while I'm speaking English, even though I may study grammar separately. So I'm unconscious of a great deal, um, and that gives me a sense of freedom. Um, and I think that's uh, something that we should consider also in this discussion. All right, that's a good point. What do you think, Don? Yeah, my understanding is also evolving, as John said. And um, the way I understand is that uh, there are causes at work uh, in whatever choices we make. And the origins of those choices um, are within us. And the idea that, you know, I could have done otherwise is also part of the, the issue of free will and determinism. So when you, when you look at the causal sequences, uh, the way we learn, the kind of influence that we have, uh, because of our genes, our learning. Um, causes uh, are always at work in all the choices we make, and they reflect uh, not just the genetics and the cultural induction, but also uh, where we are in our uh, growth and development. Like, for instance, people could be at pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional levels in var various areas of development. And so, to me, understanding choices in terms of uh, levels of development is crucial. Uh, but as you said, choices have constraints. Freedom has constraints. It has to be understood in conjunction with that. Right. And I think our bodies constrain us. I mean, I have a human body, but um, a bird, for instance, can fly and I can't. Um, mm -hmm. But I do feel I have the freedom to raise my arm, like you said. Um, but if the nerves are cut, then I don't have that freedom anymore. Right. So there's constant uh, balancing mm -hmm. of uh, freedom and constraints. And I think this is a part of our embodiment as human beings. And other nervous systems and other species, they've evolved in very different ways. And I was just thinking about how a dog, for instance, has a better sense of smell than any of us do. But a dog can never uh, tap its paw mm -hmm. to the beat of the music. So we are those uh, creatures that can um, perceive rhythm and music. So I think we all. Uh, have different kinds of nervous systems which create different kinds of worlds, different kinds of constraints, and um, I think that needs to be um, right, included in the mix yeah, of ideas John, here. All right, when you started before, you said that, um, that basically freedom um, enters into the equation as a feeling, that we have a feeling that we have a freedom, but that you know, having the feeling of being free to do things is, is far different from actually you know, being able to do things free of the things that compel us. That's a very interesting question. 
and I'm um, thinking a lot about that myself, about the relationship between what we consider as conscious and what is unconscious and how that changes from moment to moment. So um, I'm thinking about a quotation from a physicist who said that an elephant sliding down a hill, you can look at uh, the numbers involved. A physicist could measure how much the animal weighs, the incline of the hill, um, the speed that it's traveling down the hill, but none of those numbers capture the poetry of an elephant sliding down a hill. So I think we can have um, a physicist's objective approach, and we also have our embodied first-person experience. And um, I think that could be put in the mix here. Mm -hmm. As we talk about you know, the, the dimensions of this socially, as mm -hmm. you're talking about conventional and post-conventional understandings mm -hmm. of what free will involves. So when you're applying different perspectives to a particular situation, uh, you are uh, basically uh, deconstructing uh, a particular situation from multiple perspectives. So physics is one perspective, right. and then perception and the poetic or the left brain or the right brain, uh, they are you know, bringing uh, different perspectives uh, to the situation. Right. And the more perspectives we apply, the better understanding we have of the, the causal equation at work. And I agree with you that there is one universe, and it, everything is causing everything else, I suppose. Okay, John. Am I reading you correctly? Um, absolutely. You oh. know, we'll, we'll get into that actually in the next show some. Um, but, you know, basically you're, you're saying that, um, oh, like, that there is, you know, Basically, you're saying that our, our experience, you said that our experience tells us that we actually have a free will, if I understood you correctly. In some instances, yes, I feel that I'm able to act. Uh, if I want to pick this up and put it down, I experience myself as a causal agent who's performing that act. Now, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what my nervous system is doing. I'm that would be pretty impossible for me to know, and that's all unconscious. Right, and, and so naturally in that, you know, because like with experience, then we get into the question of illusion, because that's, you know, I mean, the title of the show is Exploring the Illusion of Free Will because of that. For example, our experience can tell us we look out into um, in a mirage and we'll see water on the horizon, mm -hmm. or we'll look at two lines, and because one line has arrows pointing in, the other has arrows pointing out, they'll look different sizes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so generally, generally, that's why the science is so important on this. You know, we have our, our personal experience that, as a determiner of reality, has not really been so very accurate, especially within um, the light of science. You know, for example, our, our personal experience says, the world is flat, you know, yet mm -hmm. we know it's an orb, you know, because of science because of a deeper understanding. Um, our personal experience tells us we, the world is motionless, yet we understand that we're, tr you know, um, scientifically we know we're traveling around the sun at 660,000 miles per hour. So, so while we do have that experience, that is really the, um, the challenge we're up against. We have the understanding, we have the logic, we have mm -hmm. the science on one side, we have the illusion, the experience of the illusion on the other. Okay, um, let's go on, like, I just wanted to read a sentence about what the top philosophers have thought about this subject, because I think this is telling us, a lot of people don't realize that uh, traditionally philosophers have understood this, have understood that free will is an illusion. They, you know, and this is a, um, a quote by James Jeans, Jeans who's a f uh, physicist, um, mathematician, and in a 1943 book called Physics and Philosophy, Philosophy and Physics, I'm sorry, um, he said the following, practically all modern philosophers of the first rank, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Mill, Alexander, as well as many others, have been determinists in the sense of inventing the, the cogency of the argument for determinism, but have at the same time been indeterminate in the same in the sense of hoping to find a loophole of escape from those arguments. And that's the telling point here is like they as scientists, as philosophers, as thinkers had no choice according to the evidence but to conclude that 
reality is causal, and hence our, hence our wills are causal, but it's not something they feel comfortable with, you know, because, you know, that, that just, it, to the extent that's true, we're automatons, we're robots, we're puppets, we're acting out, you know, this, this, this play, you know, this movie of life. But I think it's important, you know, for the audience, for people to understand what traditionalist think, thinking has been on the subject, that they, you know, they look at the evidence, they can't but conclude that our wills are causal. But, you know, for many of us, you know, that's, that's a very high, high price to pay. It's, it's not, it's like they, they view it in a different way. They don't view it from the right perspective of that, fine, it's causal, but life can be just as wonderful. You know, we may give up some things, but we certainly um, gain other things also. Mm -hmm. John and I were also pondering about this belief in uh, free will or in determinism what causal, causal consequences it can have. Suppose if I don't believe in free will, and that belief is going to create certain specific thoughts in me and may lead to certain specific behaviors. So that again will be deterministic. Uh, and not believing in free will and believing in free will have consequences in ourself and in the world. So it becomes uh, paradoxical at a certain level. Is there uh, anything else about consequences in the world? I mean, I wanted to explore this with all of you. Um, if we believe in free will, and if we are in a deterministic universe where causes and effects are interconnected, uh, believing in free will or not believing in free will, what kind of uh, consequences can happen? Okay. And that's, that's the, that's the all-important point, because, like, right now, our entire world operates under the presupposition, under the illusion of free will. You know, the entirety of civilization is like this. Um, our economic system of rewards, you know, toward those of us who have certain talents or abilities. Our, our criminal justice system of, of taking people who had no absolute choice of their own but to do what they did and, and sometimes imprisoning them for their lives, you know, their entire lives or, or, or executing them. Um, our education system, you know, we have, you know, it's all like based on the presupposition that because we have a free will, we should reward some people more than others. And so um, that creates a very competitive world. That's, you know, we're competing against each other for everything. And when, when we do that, we blame each other. You know, we blame each other or we'll take credit for things that aren't, you know, our, of our making. So that's what, that's one reason. I'm sorry, you want to say something? Well, I was uh, just recently listening to a, a Buddhist scholar and she was talking about something that may be related, um, how uh, um, the survival of the fittest is something that we um, emerged out of Darwin. And she thought it was much more about the survival of the kindest that may um, be more important to our survival, our ability to cooperate. So as you mentioned that, how competitive we are and how sometimes we ignore um, cooperation and how maybe that could be part of our agenda is how could we create uh, more cooperative strategies. So if we, we, have free no, will, if we have free will, we can start acting out kindly. Uh, but determinists would say that, you know, there has to be a preparation, there has to be learning. Uh, which can precede uh, that kind of behavior. So when you look at it at at from a deterministic perspective, you have to think about uh, what kind of conditions can be created before that behavior can emerge uh, on a larger scale. And then we can understand why it is not becoming the norm. We need it for our survival, for our for the planetary uh, survival at this point, the way the nations are arming themselves. We have to understand those processes. Yes, that's so important because under the free will perspective, the free will illusion, it's not just we individuals competing amongst ourselves and blaming each other as part of this competition and taking credit and taking as much for ourselves as part of the competition. It's also the matter that countries are doing this, that you know, civilization has done this probably, I don't know, since the beginning, whatever. But the idea is like, take climate change at all, at, at, you know, just on its own. Um, before now, a country could, to a certain extent, succeed and be in, a, in a somewhat of an island. You know, it doesn't, may not matter what's happening uh, in another part of the world. 
that world is vanishing faster than we we realize. Right now, we're in a world with climate change where if China, India, Brazil, um, Europe, you know, the other parts of the world, and we, you know, do not cooperate to do this, then you know, then we all lose. So, like, the competition on on this planet has has kind of like reached an apex. Mm -hmm. You know, um, now I, I suppose there there could be certain kinds of competition um, that that relate to the common good. But yeah, and also, John, when you, when you spoke of kindness, um, that's why this is so important, because um, the free will perspective promotes and encourages lack of kindness, lack of understanding, aggression, hostility, blame, um, you know, all, all, these, all these competitive, aggressive, hostile kinds of um, reactions based on the illusion, based on, on the illusion that somebody's actually responsible for their acts or, or a country's respon you know, responsible for what it does, whatever. And, and w when, we, when we understand that free will is an illusion, it's so much easier to be kind. Because if, if a person does something we might consider is wrong, immoral, whatever, and, and we understand that free will is an illusion, we'll think of that person, well, it would be wrong for me to, to indiscriminately or to, to judgmentally, you know, act against this person because this person had no, you know, choice but to do what he did. So kindness becomes so much easier, in, you know, from that perspective. Would you like to say something? <laughs> well, there's a lot there that's going on. Um, I'm curious about where does responsibility for one's actions uh, play into this? Is that just another illusion? The short answer is yes. Yes. Um, there is no, you know, if free will is a myth, then, then certainly personal responsibility is a myth. Because if we're compelled, if we're robots, automatons, puppets, if we're compelled to do everything we do, how can we be responsible for anything? You know, and then that, that brings up the question, well, then is there a God who created everything, and would that God then be responsible for everything we do? I think, that, well, that sounds very paradoxical to me. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to add to that. No, I, my understanding is that the sense of responsibility is, um, is learned. And if we can come up with, with an education which can make people think more responsibly uh, to evolve. Uh, for me, understanding of choices that humans make has a lot to do with uh, their levels of development. And if, if the majority of the people on this planet are ethnocentric, they are going to make ethnocentric choices. Can you say a little bit more about ethnocentric, what you mean by that? Uh, I mean, psych developmental psychologists have come up with, you know, some basic understandings of uh, when a child is born, a child is at the egocentric level, it's all about me. Uh, when we are socialized in a particular culture, uh, east or west, uh, it becomes uh, me and my culture and my tribe. And if we move to the next level of development, which is uh, world-centric, uh, it becomes me, my tribe, as well as all humanity. So if we are stuck at the ethnocentric level of development, we're going to make choices which will reflect that level of development. Uh, it has not to, nothing to do with free will. It has to do with the conditions which are at work, the ideas which are uh, at work in a particular society, what those ideas mean. And if they mean ethnocentricity, choices are going to reflect that. So can I ask a question about um, he was, Nomi just mentioned world-centric, and at that level, free will is different from... Choices are different. What, what is meant by free will is different from uh, someone at the ethnocentric level. Is that something that you agree with, or is there an understanding of... Are you coming from a, a more world-centric place when you're talking about free will as illusion? Um, John, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Are you, are you asking if, like, if somehow at the world level there... Um, comes a possibility for free will? Uh, I'm just wondering about uh, when you interpret free will from different levels, because okay. it may mean different things at world-centric, what was the uh, a, a conventional? Yeah, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional, uh -huh. or in a, in a particular area, we can call it egocentric, ethnocentric, 
world centric right. because, or integrated. Because this is my understanding, and it could be wrong, but people at an eth at the ethnocentric level mm -hmm. do have a strong belief in uh, responsibility, and they follow the dictates of authorities mm -hmm. who make the major decisions, the moral decisions in their lives, and it's their job to uh, fulfill their obligation to those authorities. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what right, you're saying. Right. So that's very different, I think, from uh, people who are living in a, a, a non-authoritarian, permissive kind of society where, you know, like postmodern types who are calling the shots and making it up as they go along and, you know, are very comfortable with things being relative. So I'm just curious about um, how this notion of free will will undoubtedly evolve. Um, and maybe this is what part of this program could well, be about. Yes, I mean, the concept of free will is now an anachronism. It's like anybody who believes it is simply mistaken. It's like believing in a flat world or emotionless world. So, you know, um, I would propose the, the term causal will to accurately um, describe the nature of human will. John, when you, I think what you were getting at when you asked about personal responsibility is that if we abandon, as we should, the concept of free will, how do we ensure that we, you know, do what we consider right, or where, where does morality go in that sense? And on, on, one, on one hand, um, you know, objectively there is no personal morality, but here's what I've discovered in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I have understood free will to be an illusion for decades, yet I also understand that um, that when we tend to do things that we can define as good or right, that nature or, um, or God or whatever rewards us, okay? And then when we do what's wrong, nature or God tends to punish us. And right and wrong actually being kind of like described as, as like what leads to either reward or punishment. Okay, so, so the idea, John, is like because of that, even though we understand that free will is an illusion and that we really don't have personal responsibility for anything we do, it's wise and it's important to, I think, our own welfare and societies to kind of act, to act as if we did have a free will. And, and that's not completely necessary, but that can help a lot of people. Because then the idea is that, um, Let's say we do that. Let's say we, we act as if we have free will. All right, th there's a semblance of moral responsibility, but then we also have to realize that that decision to act as if we had free will is equally compelled. It's not like something we have, we have a choice of. Can I ask you a question? Is, um, you said the act, it's an act. You act as if you have free will. And you mentioned earlier about causal will. And is there a relationship between acting as if you had will, and that causal will? Well, yes. When you act as if you have free will, you're actually acknowledging that your will is causal, that, that your will is not free. Because if, 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 if you believed in a free will, you would automatically, naturally act on that belief, you know, um, of free will. Whereas, like, if you believe in causal will, if you understand reality to be causal, the universe to be causal, then yeah, it's like you say to yourself, all right, I understand that everything that I do, including my understanding of causal will and including my um, understanding of personality or, or of um, personal responsibility is causal, um, I nonetheless will take responsibility to avoid that, you know. Is there, um, are you saying then that it's an illusion, will is an illusion, but it may be a necessary illusion? Um, <laughs> at, I think that um, at this point in civilization, to a lot of people, it may be, and, and, and we, we can only guess at this. I'm thinking, you know, if the world comes to understand that um, human will is causal and not free, 100 years from now, um, it may be that, um, that we lose our sense of ego, our, our sense of our personal self. So it's never really about what's going to be in our interest. Um, per se, but but what's what's going to be more in the common interest? But no, John, that that's a that's a that's a good question, and 
And I guess, yeah, I think this, the, the simplest answer may be that for now, that may be a necessary illusion. But like, you know, again, to the extent that we, we um, act on that illusion, to the extent, let's say, you know, for example, if, if I um, attribute personal responsibility to myself and I do some, something wrong and I then punish myself or feel guilty, then that would be a wrongful application of that understanding. Because then I'm not only acting as if I have free will, I'm acting according to that belief of free will, you know, by, by feeling guilty or punishing. I'm just thinking about, uh, in Buddhist psychology, they talk uh, about the ego and, um, and the self as being a necessary illusion. Um, ultimately, you deconstruct it in meditation practice and you, and you realize that it isn't uh, a thing, uh, but rather a process. So then you can become more adept at acting as if you had a self in the, the physical world, the social world. Mm -hmm. Is there a connection between that idea and what you were talking about? There is, absolutely. There's, there, we have about 50 um, seconds left in the show, so we won't be able to go into it in great detail. But absolutely, the Buddhists understand that, you know, as you're saying, they have a conventional reality and an absolute reality. In their conventional reality, we do have a self. You know, because that's how we operate. But they also understand that in the absolute reality, that self, that self, that ego is an illusion. So that's just a perfect example of, of, of a whole religion just coming to that understanding. They might may not express it completely in their um, in their theology and all, but they do have that. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, John. This thank has been you. good. So um, we have so much to explore in this. I mean, and and we will over over the coming weeks. That uh, this. Again, this is a world-changing topic mm -hmm. that that um, that is just getting moving, and you know I look forward to just exploring this in, in greater detail as the weeks go by. Thank you so Thank much. You guys. Very much.